texting. 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 Um. Mark Will and Tomek present. Texting. Hello, all you textual deviants, and welcome to another episode of Texting with me, Tomek, in Sankt Petersburg. And I'm Mark Will in Taipei. And by the way, if you have not subscribed to us on Substack, what are you doing? Please subscribe immediately. My Substack is markwillwrite.substack.com. That's markwill, W-R-I-T-E, dot substack.com. And yours is... Mine is tomekb.substack.com, T-O-M-E-K-B dot substack.com. And uh, yeah, we want you guys to subscribe so you can add some comments, uh, give us some feedback, and maybe argue amongst yourselves. That would be ideal. And we each do separate presentations, so you want to subscribe to both of us. You can get my take and you can get Tomek's take. What could be better than that? So let's get started. On this episode, we're going to be talking about a landmark painting by the abstract Russian artist Vasily Kandinsky. This is composition number six, which is currently held at the General Staff Building of the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, which is one of the reasons why I selected it, because I have easy access to this painting and uh, I wanted to stand before it and let it speak to me. Mark? Well, tell us tell us about that. I mean, you went and looked at it again today, did you not? Yesterday. Today I tried to look at some other Kandinsky paintings at uh, another amazing museum here called the Russian Museum, which, as it suggests, hosts exclusively Russian art. Uh, but this painting, again, is held at the Hermitage, which is the the Louvre of Russia. And uh, the cool thing is it's actually in a separate wing than the place that most tourists or most, whether they're domestic or international, go to. So it's not in the Winter Palace itself, but it's in like a separate wing called the General Staff Building. And I love this section of the Hermitage. If any of you do get a chance to visit St. Petersburg, I highly recommend this section um, because it's usually almost empty and... uh, it's the part that hosts all the French impressionistic work. So you get Monet, you get your Renoir, you get your Degas. Um, and beyond that, you've got an impressive Picasso collection, Van Gogh. And it's almost like you're at a private gallery because there are so few people that go to this particular wing. And uh, yeah, I just love it. You get great views of the Winter Palace from the windows. And uh, you can have a meditative experience with some classic art. Well, tell us what it was like looking directly at this piece, which is apparently huge. I saw that it's six foot six feet or six foot six by ten feet. Is that right? Yeah, if anything, that sounds like a conservative estimate. I mean, I don't have the dimensions in front of me. We could obviously look that up pretty easily. But uh, it's definitely huge. I mean, I'm dwarfed by this painting. And uh, in preparation for this pod, I definitely empathize with anyone who isn't able to to experience it firsthand, and particularly you, because we're going to be going into depth about it. I mean, I've got it on full screen right now on an adjacent laptop, but without seeing the texture of the paint and without sensing its scale, you definitely lose something. I mean, of course, that's the case with a lot of art. You probably could say the same for our Picasso episode recently. Um, And I'm sure we can still get plenty of meat off this bone. But uh, but yeah, it's it's much more impressive in person. And uh, I'd say one of its appeals of this particular painting is its grandeur. Well, tell us about the 
the texture. I mean, you've got to tell us what we're missing when we look at it on a screen. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a painting that is necessarily like as layered as some impressionistic paintings where you're just, you know, you're just seeing like how much paint is being used and it's like clearly a three-dimensional painting. But I think uh, just a lot of how the smudges, a lot of the kind of cloudy areas as opposed to the more solid areas and just the vibrancy of the colors themselves they're just much more vivid in paint than they are pixelated um but uh but yeah should we so just a reminder to the listener this is composition six i'm sure both of us will have posted it on our description of this episode um so as much as you can do if you are somewhere stationary right now, I strongly urge you to open it up and uh, maybe even pause the recording and give yourself a minute to sink into this collage of color. Mm-hmm. So, Mark, do you want to give some first impressions? As we did in the Picasso pod, I think what we're going to do first is rather than get into the definition of what is abstract art, what we know about Kandinsky's life story and so on because there's obviously a lot to read about him as an artist and his influence but we're going to try to just see the painting for what it is or I'm going to add like a little subtext to that for this particular painting not only what do you see but what do you hear hmm well I hear uh seven string guitar nice is that because you you can see a kind of guitar shape there right yeah well that's nice what is it what is a seven string guitar i don't know but that's that's what it looks like you know a guitar neck it looks like there's seven strings there's Mm -hmm. a kind of body that's you know suggested but that's my naive first impression along with a hand a tail something that looks like the claw of a a lobster or crab do you want to point out sections of the painting where you're seeing this stuff well you see the seven string guitar right yes and actually like again i'm gonna try to avoid what i know about the painting but that body of the guitar is meant to be one of the centers of the painting. I I saw that too, but yeah, yeah. let's let's put okay. a pin in that, as they sure. say. Well, do you see the hand? That's like yeah, coming out of the body of the guitar, right? Yeah, so maybe that's like uh-huh. someone strumming this this guitar that doesn't actually exist, right? Uh. And then do you see the tail? Specify, please. Lower left corner. Okay, so what I see in that lower left corner, or like I'm having trouble unseeing it, is like a like a bird or like a lizard bird. Do you see that? So it's like facing left and it's... That blue dot, that far blue dot is the eye. Right? Oh, yeah. Got that yeah, kind of... yeah, yeah. And then that's yeah. that's what? Like the the leg of the bird? Exactly. Oh, yeah. oh, I see. Yeah, there's like a tail pointing downwards, right? Yeah, potentially. Or ta- ta- tail feathers, you know. Right. Yeah, I see that. I mean, again, we talked about this in another episode where... Uh, I don't think it was the Picasso episode, but some texts are like Rorschach tests. You know, you see, right? You see, what you see is is more a product of what's in your mind than what's actually there, right? Or it could be right. like gazing at clouds. Like everyone's going to see something different. But do you see the the claw of the crab or lobster? Possibly. Is that like top center-ish? No. 
But so I, I see some like crab like colors up there. Okay, yeah. Like a lobster color. No, I'm looking I'm it's not uh Ah, bottom bottom right? Right. Yeah, it it's not the right color, but just the shape suggests that to me. Uh-huh. And then there's another uh series of lines, but in this case, this is the upper right corner uh these Mm -hmm. don't look like strings on a musical instrument they're more like i don't know like uh uh scratches right yeah there's a darker quality to them as if he as if he like intentionally defaced something or wanted to cross it out yes exactly and there's something that above that there's something that looks like a, a worm or a caterpillar or something or like a little embryo embryo yeah i see another bird in the upper left corner potentially yeah a lot there's a lot going on here i thought i had seen a human face somewhere but now i can't find it I mean, those are up in the upper right corner. You could say the blue and the red, or they resemble eyes. There's something like a snake under that, at least in terms of its. the The line has has like an undulating. Uh, shape. It's almost like looking like looking at clouds, right? Where you can start just pulling stuff or wa- or a certain wallpaper. Yeah, that's that's what I said. It's like a yeah, sure, sure. test yeah, or sure. or clouds. Like we're go- you can see anything. Like you know, it's more a result of of what the viewer brings to it than anything that's actually depicted. I'll tell you where I see a face. It's just below the neck of the quote-unquote guitar i just saw it too there's an eye it looks like an eye right and i see like a man's hair and then an eye and then a nose and a mouth but it's quite small and it's point the face is pointing towards the upper right corner and it's just just below the neck oh it's like in, neck. It, it's like in profile in profile exactly and it, he's got like puckering lips and a and a prominent chin and like a humpback if you wanted to see it as a body as well behind him oh yes it's a (laughs) homunculus homunculus racticus so i think fair enough if we're going to look for forms but I would say that's kind of not what Kandinsky wants us to be doing anyway. So what about just how you respond to this particular set of color choices? Or, yeah, what do you think about the color in this painting? Well, the most prominent colors are red, blue, yellow. Suggestions. Purple, kind of right, purpley pinky stuff, right? Okay, yes. Suggestions of green or, you know, blue-green. And black. Black, of course. White. Uh, I like I like the colors. Mm-hmm. Uh, does it appear as dark in person as my printout? does my printout i mean it could just be like the the toner or whatever of the <laughs> printer i use you know seriously like even i know even it's the, just funny because like you know even well even the different versions you see online i i remember when i was selecting the image for the picasso episode like everyone online is a little bit different you know in yeah, terms of the totally. in terms of the the lighting so i'm just wondering is like how bright is it in person you know i mean i sent you a photo and i'll, I'll attach this as well to our post 
of me standing in front of it. And so I'm kind of like looking at that next to my, what I'm looking at on a computer monitor. And I mean, you could also argue that it depends on the lighting of the gallery, right? So there's a lot of factors, but uh, it seems bright enough. <laughs> but I mean, I would just say that the black is, if anything, like just the amount of black that Kandinsky has used here. That gives means the painting something. Like, that yeah, that has some kind of significance, right? Like and it affects such... just the overall lightness of the painting, right? Mm -hmm. He's he's so, I mean, like that... he's like uh, emphasizing the shadow aspect of whatever this this vision is. Uh, yeah. As I'm as I'm looking and I'm thinking about how large it is and. Uh, I'm remembering the picture of you standing in front of it. You didn't right. seem to be completely dwarfed, but maybe that's because you were like several feet away. And so it's kind of like in the background. Whereas if you stood, right. if you stood right next to it, you would be pretty much. And I might have been exaggerating a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but either way, it's a big painting. Yeah, it's big. So I'm wondering like, how did he, how did he paint this? Was it, you know, did he have it like on the floor and just sort of move around the edges? Did he did he have it on the wall and then just go from top to bottom? Or, you know, he started at the corners and worked inward or started in the center and worked outward. I'm very curious about how he would have you know, technically how he executed this. Did right, you find right. I, I didn't look into that. Did you? No, I mean, I've got some other kind of like cool factoids about the process, but nothing about that aspect. But what do you think? And I'll, and I'll save the... Do you I mean, obviously a lot of painters use large canvases, but maybe a ladder for certain sections. Right. I would think that it would be easier to work on it upright rather than laying on the ground. I mean, I know like somebody like Jackson Pollock might would have it on the ground. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah, I would imagine it, it was just more comfortable to have a more 90 degree angle. I don't know, where you're standing and then you've got your arm extended, right? That seems easier. I don't know. Um, That's how I would prefer to paint anyway, I think. If I was really... It just seems like it would be more physically comfortable. Otherwise, you're, you're crouching a lot otherwise, right? Here's another question. Go for it. Do we necessarily have to view it as it is presented at the Hermitage? I've got a printout here. I can turn it any direction. And in fact, when I, you know, after I printed this out, I had to check and make sure which way, which, which way was up, you know? Like, why do we why do we have to accept that? Why can't they, every six months, rotate it and turn it another way, or or, you know, it, instead of landscape, present it as portrait style? Why not? Well, obviously, if that was if that was a paint the painter's request, right? But the, I think it's more about like the sanctity of what the artist wanted. But I think that's like. Other, other than that, I agree with everything you're saying, and like it, it adds an interesting dimension. What you're able to do with a more mobile version. Well, I'm. So I mean, it. Hundred percent agree in that sense. I'm. I'm reappropriating his text, and when I turn right. it, when I turn it, actually any other direction, I'm looking at something completely different and i'm seeing different things too right oh yeah, yes I mean, maybe and we should I, make the whole episode about the upside down version can you do you have that capability you yeah you I, have i'm it turning it right now as we speak but I'm, i do can you, still turn around my laptop do you now see a human face like it's it's obvious now which direction upside down yes where is the face now? It's like lower left. 
Do you see yeah. that face? Yeah, yeah, I see that face now. Which, yeah. which, which, before reminded me more of a hand, but this way, you know, it looks like a face. A a strange face, but still, there's like an eye, and a nose, and a weird mouth. Right. And I see, you know, more bird-like elements. I mean, it's a... I think this is a... an important consideration, because why, why do we have to accept one particular perspective yeah and i have a tidbit about that as well but i don't know if i should save it go Which ahead is, maybe okay well, i just think i read something like he came into a room once and he was looking at a painting and he didn't realize that it was like his work upside down <laughs> so hmm. so because yeah, someone so, someone hung it on the wall wrong right I see. So, he didn't know it was his. I think that's how it went. I I should have uh, double checked that, but something like that. Well, I can yeah. well I can well believe it because when you you know just changing the the way it's presented, uh, it's it's quite significant. We're looking at something completely different, and then again, look at it as. A portrait look at the portrait uh perspective rather than you know landscape right. uh-huh and obviously we have two different options for the portrait as yes well, right? yes right i mean there are four ways you could look at this i mean you could look at other ways too right sure like, dude, like yeah the, but yeah yeah you could enough. you could reverse it you could just show the back part of the of the framed canvas. Which, I mean, I mean, he's and there's a, even stuff like the mood that you're in when you see a painting, right? I mean, that's another thing. That's another variant. Mm-hmm. So. Well, but it's also the environment, like seeing it in the hermitage is different from seeing it like at a, I don't know, an, an outdoor uh, expo for starving artists. You know, right. what, if you, what if you encountered this there instead of in the hallowed halls of the hermitage? No doubt. I mean, that's a whole other conversation is like how, and I think we did talk about that a little bit in the Picasso episode, but. Well, in the, these... the uh, Waking Life episode too, The Frame, you know. All of that's part of the frame, where you see it, the environment, and so on. I was thinking more in terms of like the brand, though, the brand name recognition that certain artists get. Sure. That, like, yeah, you know, they inflict this this additional gravitas. Yeah. What if you What if you saw some Vasily Kandinsky in Saint Petersburg, twenty twenty two, wearing a COVID mask or not? on the street selling his work and you saw something like this how would you right. how would you react i mean what did people well, at the time 19 what was it 1913 like how did they react this was at that time this was like completely revolutionary this is one of the first I mean, abstract sure art, artworks ever right well he is i mean this is composition six so he's yeah. obviously been dabbling for a while but sure right true i would say though like one of the kind of criticisms that the amateur eye makes looking at abstract art is like oh well you know my blah blah, blah could do this kind of thing my six-year-old but this painting doesn't necessarily have that quality right like it is comp i would say generally an abstract painting meaning like looking for forms again i don't know how like how interesting that is that particular pursuit but 
if we talk about still, you can sense a lot of variety. You can see, you can sense that there's a certain mastery, right? That went into just the physical aspect of like the skill level that it required to paint this. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe Liliana and I could sit down and, and with paintbrushes and create something pretty badass just using color. But I don't know. I wonder, I guess I'm just asking about, I wonder how much technical proficiency it requires to create this particular aesthetic. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, if you're able to approximate something like that now, it's because you're standing on the shoulders of giants, you know? Like he, right, right. he, he was the pioneer. He was the first one to do this, to discover mm-hmm. this in a way. So, like, if it seems technically easier now, it's because he blazed those trails. Right. <clears throat> but I guess I'm just saying, rather than, like, certain... Like, today I was looking at some Malevich, which is just, like, a solid black square, you know, or or the Rothko we mentioned earlier. This does seem like it's taken quite a bit more labor, in that sense, right? So coming back to your question of if I saw this on the street, knowing nothing, I would still be like, okay, well, this person put a lot of himself or herself into it. Oh, yeah. I mean, in terms of like time intensive work, clearly there's, it's quite intricate and there's a lot of detail and there were many, it, it, has the appearance of being well planned, you know, even though the the result is somewhat chaotic, it it looks like he had some sort of plan in mind. It's not just random. I mean mm-hmm. the the random chaotic feeling we might get is due to very careful design considerations. Wouldn't you agree? It would be interesting. I would agree. I mean, I definitely think that's the case, but I also think it would be interesting to contrast it with something that another artist did completely spontaneously and see, like, if what, what, if anything, is lost without making that initial plan. Because I know that Kandinsky did extensive studies. But yes, know? yes, I, I saw that too. But you say you know, some other artist might do it spontaneously, but that's just the execution of it. Like, what about all the thought and planning that went into it before paint touched, paintbrush touched canvas at all? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, but my point is more, if you went into doing this without any planning and you just like, Got, you just started like messing around with colors and just being like, okay, I'm going to put some of this over here. I'm going to put some, like, how much would the, that effect be diminished? Like, but, would, but we, would we be looking at it with the same level of, well, I'm wow, so, what I'm cool saying mix. is, what I'm saying is that's never the case. There's always something that precedes that, like previous experiences. I mean, I'm thinking of like a jazz musician, right? Like, sure. He, he or she takes a solo and you know he or she is improvising but what went into that uh performance prior to the actual playing of the notes you know we're talking years of of uh experimentation and practice and mastery of the instrument uh perhaps familiarity with the with the chords of the particular uh tune that's being played no i get you 100 percent. but i'm saying even like what what about disregarding all that i'm saying someone going into this completely unpracticed versus someone who's you know put in the work like do you think we would notice how much of a difference do you think we would notice hopefully we would notice a significant difference right I don't know, hopefully or not hopefully. I mean, I'm not trying to put a You mean a person it, who's not technically a painter? A, exactly. Oh, I and see. someone who hasn't... That's my point. Yeah. I see. 
Um, because it's so chaotic, right? Like you can, a jazz musician, they would still have a certain ability to produce sound that would show how versed they are, mm-hmm. right? Like there, it'd just be the, the, the tone of, of Miles Davis's trumpet right. is not something that an amateur could achieve. But if we just gave someone a shitload of color who's never painted before, could they produce that a would be a, Kandinsky? That's what you're asking. Well, could they produce something that we would look at and be like, wow, that is like a really sick contrast of color, you know, mm-hmm. which lends itself to great conversation. And again, like you, half of me like hopes that isn't the case, but half of me is like, well, fuck it. Why not? Like right. it's still color ultimately that's speaking to us or, or it's, it's just like, it's color that's just provoking a conversation and color is something that is primal to us and speaks to us. Yeah. So I don't know, but anyway, can I ask you just a little bit more about like the, because I think what Kandinsky is, you know, going to be the, the thing that's going to like change each painting from one to the next is like the proportions of color, the placement of color and the shapes of the colors. So, this particular painting, Composition 6, like, what kind of mood are you getting from it? And, yeah, can you speak a little bit more just to, like, your visceral reaction, but, like, excluding form? Like, is it, a, is well, it happy to you? Do, you? do you feel good when you look at it? I'm not sure I can describe how I feel. I think I'm unduly influenced by something I read and after I read that uh, I was unable to look at this without thinking about what I read Mm -hmm. is that about should we just start letting the outside stuff trickle in then a little bit more Uh, I think so and trickle is a a good yeah exactly a good word to use because Uh as you probably discovered too his his uh, German girlfriend told him to think of the word überflut which right. which means overflow or flood and uh apparently he was he was stuck with this like he had been thinking about right. it he didn't know how to move forward and so she said you know think of this word and he started chanting it almost like a mantra as he was working right you know uber flute uber flute uber flute <laughs> overflow overflow flood flood and i see that you know it's it's sure. very much right it's very much like that and it's if you look at some of the other kandinsky paintings which are online this is this seems unique in a way like it's much less geometrical it's more chaotic mm-hmm. they're more there is more of that you know overflowing quality and of course Absolutely. and of course what do i think of when i think of overflow wordsworth is that a trick okay poetry mm-hmm. poetry right. is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings mm-hmm I can't look at and, at this without thinking of that. I mean, and then and then he continues. It takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. So this is Wordsworth's definition still. Yeah, yeah. This is Wordsworth. This is his, you know, famous uh, formula for the composition of poetry as he and you know perhaps Coleridge conceived of it you know as their as their uh starting this romantic movement it's just an interesting juxtaposition the word overflow with uh with tranquility because in a way they feel like they don't feel like friends Yes, but it's recollected in tranquility. In other words, you experience the the uh, powerful feelings 
the overflow of powerful feelings in real time. And then later, you rec uh, you recollect that emotion in tranquility. And then you can produce, right? Okay. So this this perhaps speaks to all the planning and the designing that he did before he allowed that emotion to overflow onto the canvas. You know, there was still a period should... of tranquility where he his conscious mind took over to some extent and you know, he did studies, he he had all these plans. And again, this is like a a jazz musician, you know, rehearsing, practicing, mastering the instrument. And then when, you know, there's a live performance, he or she has to deliver. Right. The, the, that emotion, there's a spontaneous overflow of those powerful feelings. I wanted to add, you mentioned that Munter had repeated this word or had suggested repeating the word Uberflut. Mm -hmm. Just we should we should also note that it was his original concept to evoke a flood, baptism, destruction and rebirth simultaneously. So she just really wanted him to get it out more by repeating that word. But he, he did have this concept beforehand, just to okay. just as a note. Yeah, yeah. Was it a um, was his idea that it was like a biblical flood i think so yeah um Maybe. but i think it's also referring to like the turbulent period that was going on maybe politically so he's seeing it he says a tremendous disaster i saw which that is taking place that's a great of, yeah. that's a great phrase tremendous disaster yeah. I'll just read the sentence. A tremendous yeah. disaster which is taking place objectively is an absolute and at the same time an independent warm song of praise similar to the anthem of a new creation following the disaster. I mean, we often hear that kind of like those two things put together, right? Like the after the fall kind of comes the the rebirth and that's a... Well, could yeah, these... I mean, such a, it's a cliche. Could these colors... Well, be the rainbow after the flood after the deluge yeah i think that's i think that's a good observation for sure and i think in general the fact that i think this painting has a unique blend of that destruction and still hopefulness i mean the i look at this painting yeah and i don't I don't feel a particular sense of doom. Like I don't feel particularly swayed to either side. Like that's why I, when I asked you about like your just general emotional reaction to it, it's kind of a, uh, it doesn't really sway me either way, particularly. It's kind of like just a lot is going on. In, in terms of, you mean towards hope or despair? Exactly. And, and or towards like characterizing this painting as a, yeah, as optimistic or, or pessimistic. Mm hmm. It's it's more just about a zone of massive chromatic turbulence, and I stole that phrase from somewhere. <laughs> but, That's yeah. pretty good, though. It's tur it's, it's turbulent, right? Mm -hmm. It's very it's jarring, I would say. I mean, you walk into the museum and you're, you're like, "Damn, like this this is not like the other paintings." Right. Uh, still to this day, I mean, so. What did you find out about his interest in the esoteric and spiritualism and theosophy? Well, okay, so I guess let's... I'm not an expert because maybe that part wasn't as interesting for me. What I will mention is like a Guardian article that I read today, which was like quite derisive of Kandinsky. Uh, so Kandinsky had some very lofty aims with his work and essentially he thought that you know this his style or his approach to painting was meant to reveal the soul or using the word soul a lot whether you want to say emancipate the soul and and he it was meant to emancipate the soul of the viewer as well uh and there's a lot we can untangle there 
but just to try to answer your question, yeah, he became very interested in a movement called theosophy, which the closest I could describe it as is something like Scientology. So it mixes science, philosophy, and probably some version of Christianity. It reminds me of it reminded me of that movie by uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, the, ma- the master. master. Yeah, the master. I, I thought did, about that film. I didn't see it, but okay. Yeah, I just saw it last year, actually. Mm-hmm. So it's still kind of like vivid in my mind. But uh, yeah, I guess the point that this Guardian writer was saying is just like it, that part of in this big exhibition that they had at the Tate a few years ago. It's like they kind of conveniently avoided that part of his narrative in the way that they presented his work. In, and so he, and he thought that was because people are like inclined to snicker a little bit now at his links to like that kind of new age occultism mm-hmm. um, because he was maybe seeing these things as, yeah, like, like these, these esoteric shapes were reflecting like spirit bodies, you know, that were, were, were able to like liberate us completely from this world. So yeah, I can't get too deep in that, but that's something. Well, this I asked that so I could tell my mother okay, well my mother well story. Please. <clears throat> so, uh, I visited Mexico uh, when I was I don't know twenty. I I went to Monterrey with uh, my friend Antonio, and we went to bro. The, really quick, I'm not going to interrupt you. Don't worry, but like I had like an epic trip. At age twenty, as well in Mexico with my friend Scott. So, where did you go? To Mexico. We went mainly to just to Sonora, different parts of Sonora. So, like the you know, we we came down from Arizona, mm-hmm. and we got relatively deep. I mean, especially for like white boys, you know, like we like brought my car and we had some serious adventures, but we didn't like get super far into Mexico, and then we ended up like popping up um, through Texas. Like that's how we came out. So. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't remember which border that would have been. What am I? It's like the El Paso. Well, border, that you went through Juarez, which yeah, through Juarez. I think exactly. I don't think you'd want to do that now, but uh, maybe maybe <laughs> even then, I think it was back pretty sketchy. Then. Yeah, yeah. But we just were coming through. We didn't like chill in Juarez. Right. Well, anyway, uh, my yeah, my my friend was from Monterrey, so uh, nice. We went there and we went to the local museum and um, <clears throat> there was some abstract art on display and uh, there were, I guess, reproductions of the work of someone named Robert Motherwell and I had never heard of this artist. And there was a quote, there was a quote which was featured prominently in the exhibition and it said, El arte abstracto es una forma de misticismo. And so, nice. we, so we thought that was so pretentious and pompous that it became like a, an inside joke for the whole trip. You right. know, like every five minutes. Pero el arte abstracto es una forma de misticismo. But I th- I thought of that, uh, and for those of you that that uh, don't speak Spanish or can't understand my shitty acento mexicano, uh, wasn't too bad. It it means abstract art is a form of mysticism, but apparently Kandinsky believed that himself, like. Quite literally, you know, his interest in oh, yeah. the mystical, the esoteric, the occult, as you said. I mean, that's mm-hmm. really what he's trying to do. He's trying to depict the soul. And we can talk about the influence on music, or the influence of music on of his, music, of music right. on his, his painting as well. But, uh, you know, maybe this, maybe Motherwell was right after all. And I, you know, as as a my youthful mockery was inappropriate and out of place. I still think it's funny because 
you know. Yeah, I think both are true, you know. Right. It's like one of those things where taken out of context, I totally I get where you're coming from, but uh it's it sounds you know, like a British bit, people it sounds a bit right pretentious, right? But I actually I've come to appreciate Mother Will's work. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but I quite like some of some of his paintings you know he was part of that new york school with uh rothko and uh Mm -hmm. pollock too maybe so it it turns out he even though he was unknown to me he's he's a fairly you know fairly well-known member of that that group of original american abstract artists well, I think we should talk a little bit about abstract art now and maybe how Kandinsky perceived abstract art. I think something very interesting in terms of what appealed to him about leaving forms is because that's that's just for people who may not understand exactly what is considered abstract. It's it's when you leave the world of representation and form and you can correct me because I'm I'm not no art expert myself but you get into well it's abstracted so the impressionists were already starting to like flirt with that type that level of dissent and they're like no fuck off we're not gonna go for necessarily pictorial accuracy with painting and we talked about that a little bit on the Picasso episode, but we're going to em- instead emphasize light more or the impression that we're getting from stuff rather than like the exact representation. But even that would have felt really limiting uh, for Kandinsky. And he actually envied musicians because he felt like what, what musicians are able to do is they're representing the emotional experience or the soul without the confines of like, oh, I have to paint this thing that I see. They're just able to just speak really directly through their music. And he's like, he also wanted just to be free of the, yeah, the limitation that sticking to form represented. And I think that that's, when it's put that way, and I should also note that Kandinsky is, was a huge theorist. And if anything, some people say that he's more influential today because of his theory. Than his actual than he is work. Of it. Right. And that also begs the question, like, how much does an artist need to kind of defend his work to for his work to be like respected? That's another question. But I'll just I just wanted to also mention one more sentence, which I thought is interesting about abstract art. Um, abstraction leaves something out. It gives your eye the chance to experience true freedom. And I thought that's cool, because in a way, like when you look at art with form, not only is the painter imprisoned in some way, but so is the viewer, right? Like the viewer, it's like the whole difference between, I guess you could say movie versus book, right? Like movie, they've done the thinking for you. Book, you have to do the work. And when we're looking at abstract forms, we have to do a bit more of the work, but we're also liberated from seeing something in a way that we ha- that ties us to all our associations of the thing or either way it's just we're bound to like oh this is this human and this is this chair and so on so i just talked a lot but you feel free to respond to any of that well as you were talking about the concept of abstract art i was thinking about the actual word abstract uh, mm-hmm. it means and i'm wondering like the history of the word who first came up with that term abstract art I don't know the answer, but, you know, abstract... You're the etymology, dude. Well, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. That's what I'm thinking of, the etymology. It means literally dragged away. That's what abstract means. So, okay. or having been dragged away. So, it's dragged away from what? Reality? Uh, mm-hmm. And who who decided, like, okay, what came before when you know realism was the the touchstone of excellence or whatever that was concrete concrete art but now we've got you know we've got something we're going to call abstract art which is like dragged away or or ripped away from reality 
or or mm. you know any concern with realism it, do, yeah. do you think kandinsky i mean was he i don't know the history was he one of the first to use this terminology if he's such a I'm theorist not sure, to be honest if he's such a theorist but, maybe yeah. he maybe he was one of the first or maybe he was a critic but you know maybe he like in his theoretical writings was promoting this idea no this is something new we're doing this is abstract art art which is you know depicting something which is torn away dragged away from reality and the the principle of realism i think that's something worth exploring is his relationship to the word itself but what do you think about like the rest of the stuff in terms of like the liberation that he sensed when he left the world of forms well i mean did you i'm sure you saw some of his uh early realistic works right mm -hmm. like he he was very much a traditional realist painter uh and had he not moved beyond that would he be remembered today at all maybe not like well remember he wasn't even a painter though really i mean he was it was a basically a hobby and he got a degree or got a phd in law and philosophy i think or either way he was a he was a professor standard in a more standard field and he wasn't planning to be a professional painter until and i can like sorry to cut you off but he had this sort of like really powerful experience with a painting um by monet called haystacks end of summer mm -hmm. did you see this no no tell me oh, okay so well if you can pull it up it's called again haystacks end of summer mm -hmm. uh and it's a pretty cool story so he was in moscow and here's the quote for how he responded to this painting which i love the monet painting by the way it's like i just, just i love monet in general and what he does with light here but he said that it was a haystack the catalog informed me i could not recognize it this non-recognition was painful to me i considered that the painter had no right to paint indistinctly i duly felt that the object of the painting was missing and I noticed with surprise and confusion that the picture not only gripped me, but impressed itself ineradicably on my memory. Painting took on a fairy tale power and splendor. So it's like, you know, if it's, it's, I like how his first reaction is like to scold this painter, right? Who's like dared to play with form and not paint something very distinctly. And then in like, upon reflection, he's like, holy shit, this is that shit. You know, like this is, this is like the stuff that's really like getting my, rocking my socks off. Well, maybe, you know, what he, what he did was the next logical step, right? After impressionism mm -hmm. and say point, right. say pointillism where right. images right. are reduced to dots, you know, eventually mm -hmm. you're yep. going to, you're going <clears> to <throat> deconstruct those forms altogether and it's like right you you open up entirely new possibilities and if like pointillism uh i don't know it 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 introduces a kind of my uh microscopic uh aspect to to the visual field right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking about not so much composition six, but some of the other Kandinsky paintings I've been browsing. <clears throat> a lot mm -hmm. of those look like uh, a lot of the, the shapes in particular that he depicts. They, they remind me of like, well, the word mitochondria kept coming to mind <laughs> because it, it looks like parts of a cell. So it looks like, Things. I know exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it looks like yeah. things that you would see under a microscope. And so maybe like impressionism, pointillism, 
it led inevitably to you know a kind of deeper a more uh focused even microscopic kind of abstraction moving dragging dragging uh you know visual representation further from the so-called real i mean it's a it's really right. it's really a different kind of real it's a uh hyper reality or a, a surreal uh, quality that is uh, evoked. But I want to keep pressing you on this, like this quote, for example, it gives your chance, your eye, the chance to experience true freedom. Like, do you feel more free when you look at abstract painting? Do you enjoy that freedom, that al quote, alleged freedom? And do you agree that it's freedom? As opposed to what in comparison with what? As opposed to form, as opposed to a painting with with clear form form is emptiness emptiness is form <laughs> okay then like uh, a painting i'm not being i'm painting. not being facetious either like i really think that yeah but uh, i mean but, are you asking like do i prefer abstract art to like you know realistic art Yes, exactly, but I'm but specifically on that point because maybe not in every aspect, right? Like it's we would be silly to to say that like each genre of art doesn't have doesn't provide us with a lot of satisfaction and or can. So I'm I don't necessarily want to say one is superior, but is that is that one of abstract art's strengths or one of its main appeals is like a is what it gives us as a viewer like it frees us from being tied to a certain form yes i think so i mean i think mm -hmm. i appreciate that aspect of it i like yeah i like experimentation you know right otherwise what's the point i want i want art that does something new and different right i want i want it to break new ground and take me someplace I've never been, you know? Right, right. Sure. I think two major topics we could still explore are color and music. Well, and music... I think those are like what Kandinsky is known for. So, yeah, do you want to jump on either of those? Well, music in particular. I mean, I saw that he was very influenced by Wagner. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, apparently, uh, Schoenberg too. Like he, that was his favorite composer. Yeah, he yeah. knew him, and so you, you know, Schoenberg is famous for the uh, twelve-tone compositions, which were, you know, revolutionary at the time. I don't really know his work. I just know it's atonal. Yes, that's the which, that, which presents its own challenges to the to the ear. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, I mean, it's analogous. He he was doing in music what uh, something similar to what uh, you know Kandinsky was doing in the field of painting. Like it's it was completely new and revolutionary. Whether mm. you you know whether you enjoy the results. That's a an, another matter, but it was a completely new right. way of approaching composition. And I mean, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I've never gotten deeply into Schoenberg's music, actually, but uh, I I do I actually read uh, some of his writings on music theory just because. I was interested in how he, I, I wanted to understand what the, you know, the 12 tone compositional process was like, but it's, it's, you know, it's quite foreign to, to what I do musically, you know, my, as a songwriter, my stuff is chord based. Yeah, you've got a, you've got a kind of classic, almost Beatles 
feel to your songs. Yeah. I mean, and I say that as a compliment. Yeah, well, I mean, it's... I, I've never really experimented with, like, 12-tone composition, but it it's not... I don't know if it would be appropriate for the, the song format. Right. You know, it's more like orchestral, sure. instrumental right. work. I, I, I would be interested in experimenting with it, but that's not really my focus. But uh, it's interesting that yeah. Kandinsky ties some like ties music directly to color. So, for example, he's he theorized that yellow is the color of middle C on a brassy trumpet. Mm-hmm. Black is the color of closure and the end of things. And that combination of colors produce vibrational frequencies akin to chords played on a piano. I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, well, one more quote. Color is the keyboard. Sorry. The eyes are the hammers. The soul is the piano with many strings. The artist is the hand which plays, touching one key or another to cause vibrations in the soul. Well, I'm thinking of... Uh, uh, one of Wagner's terms, uh, the German is Gesamtkunstwerk, which is the total artwork. This is what he aimed for in his music dramas. In other words, it's okay. it's music, it's drama, it's uh, you know uh, visual art as well in in the costumes and the stage designs and so on. So. Is he is he trying to is Kandinsky trying to achieve a kind of synthesis of the arts as well? Like he's he's trying to combine painting with music and what else? I think so. I mean, I was thinking about Bowie a lot. You know, Sound mm. and Vision. Ah, yes, right. And uh, another thing that's generally attached to Kandinsky is just the fact that he experienced what he claims to have absolutely experienced synesthesia which is for those who don't know is when you're experiencing one sense but you're kind of overpowered with another sense at the same time i I don't know is that a good definition was that well can you give a more concrete less abstract example like I, sure. So he would listen to a, a symphony and apps and see explicit colors. Yes, right. Pouring out. Yeah, that's a <clears throat> that's one of the most common manifestations. Or, you know, uh, like Rimbaud thought the vowels A E I O and U, each one he associated with a different color. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so he he sort of had a synesthetic sense of literature, I guess you could say. And I think Baudelaire may have as well. Uh, But, you know, I wonder how arbitrary these things are, right? Like maybe Rimbaud saw these particular colors when he heard these particular vowels, but someone else could associate each vowel with a different set of colors right i mean i like i like the idea of systems but i don't think they're universal i think they're particular to uh you know individual artists but if it helps them produce their work then i'm in favor of their theories right you know i would agree with you there because i think that i was kind of like slightly put off by how by exa- just by how much Kandinsky was positing in his theories in a way that was just seemed a bit too confident you know like he was defining each color really concretely you know warmth is a tendency towards yellow and coldness a tendency towards blue yeah you can't take that you know, yeah and, you can't take that too seriously it's like okay that's what that's what you think if it helps you uh, create your paintings, then that's great. But to expect right. everyone, which is else... not to say there isn't some truth, right? Like we do, it is for sure. There are some things that probably are like 
they tend towards universal. Well, yeah, like we think of how we respond to blue. Yeah, and red we think and black. Of blue as being more cool and red as being more hot. You know, but uh, I think we have to. We can't. Right, ta- we can't right. take these theories too seriously. You know, in in every aspect because there's just some arbitrary idiosyncratic personal shit going on there but again yeah and it's just you know if that's yeah go on well if that's his interpretation and it's his system anytime you systematize things like that you're gonna simplify and you're you're gonna maybe claim that it's universal but it's not you know there's there's cultural there are cultural differences there are individual differences like I just see it as a kind of framework for producing stuff. And it's interesting to discuss, right? For example, he did the same kind of theory about geometric figures. And he says, like, one of the examples is, like, he said the circle is the most peaceful shape and represents the human soul. Yeah. But there is, but at the same time, like, today I was looking at two paintings uh, by um, Malevich again. Like, one is a... absolutely black square and one is absolutely black circle and Liliana and I like both agreed in terms of like the harmony of circles in general right like there is something more calming about a circle than a square would you agree maybe but you know why can't the soul so called be a triangle you know (laughs) that's some Illuminati shit dog there you go that's that that's that illuminati shit well three sides there's there's the trinity you know right. three sides one shape or maybe it's a a circle or a a triangle circumscribed by a circle i mean you, you could you could say anything represents sure. the soul you right. know a dot could represent the soul a star i've got a star quote for you could could represent the soul here's like here's kandinsky at his at his most pompous and it's a really funny quote mm-hmm. he said the contrast between the acute angle of a triangle and a circle has no less effect than god's finger touching atoms in michelangelo oh i think i saw that yeah <laughs> i like that <laughs> Oh man. I mean, fair enough, right? He's he's bigging up his movement and his approach, but uh I don't know that many people would necessarily feel the same. I mean, I don't know, you know. It's tricky, but well, I admire him. Like I'm just I admire all, him yeah. for taking that stand and making those very public sure. pronouncements and working out his theories, you know. <clears throat> we don't have to accept them dogmatically or become his right. disciples and acolytes, but it's useful when we're looking at his work. I think I like I like to know where he's coming from, and I think, you know, in his case, maybe the theoretical writings are an important aspect of uh, our appreciation and understanding of his work. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, massively. I mean, this is a guy who's committed to academic life, intellectual life. Not only did he was he initially planning on being a professor, but then even after becoming a more renowned painter, he was te- he was constantly teaching, namely at the Bauhaus uh, in Munich. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think that just theory and writing were things that obviously gave him a lot of satisfaction. Well, I mean, I, so, I yeah. when I know like the the background. Well, think of like behind the music episodes. I always enjoy those. I like to know about how a song or a piece of music came to be written. You know, what's the backstory? It's sure. always it always deepens my appreciation. Or like, oh, yeah. what 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 was the artist trying to do? 
sometimes they were trying to do something and they failed and the result was more interesting than what they planned. Knowing all that is always a plus for me. Sure. I guess I, I also, he also has to just be able to produce beauty though. And I think that's like one, he must have produced beauty or he, over time, anyway, I don't think his legacy will survive unless his pain- paintings stand for themselves in terms of just, like, giving people something that they really like, right? I mean, some people's paintings just become, like, logos, and that and when you get to that point, that's, like, kind of concerning for me, you know? Like, because then you don't really know if someone likes a painting for its beauty or if it, they just like it because they've seen it branded so many times in magazines and then Mm -hmm. they want to go see it at a museum just so they can like have seen that thing that is like imprinted in our mass media. Yeah. So maybe Kandinsky is like guaranteed success now just because of that. He's like his paintings have achieved like an iconic status just from fame. But is that a bad thing? I don't know. I mean, it's just like, I don't know. He's just like a, I don't know. He's like a milestone. An art historical milestone. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. He's just like... I guess not, but... He's a la- just you said the it point at where the we... beginning. It's a landmark, you know? Uh, right, but it becomes... I just start to feel like we... And, and me very much included in this. Like, we start to experience art as like... How many of like the famous paintings have oh, I seen? Oh, yes. That... We're culture hounds, you know? It's like... But Culture Hound, that's cool if we're doing it, like, after just art, if, like, the experience of art. But if we're doing it to kind of, like, just experience the big dogs, the quote-unquote big dogs, then I think we're losing something, right? Well, I don't know. I don't want to judge people. No, I don't either. You're right. People can do what they want. They can, like, collect canonical. Who, Who am I to say that I'm not doing the same thing, you know? I... I Me guess, too, but we're starting to bow to hierarchies is my point, if we're doing well, that, right? I, we're I'm not, like, I don't feel that I am. What I'm doing is I'm looking for inspiration uh, for my own work, you know? So when I'm being a culture hound and I'm uh, collecting masterpieces or uh, great works mentally you know not like literally purchasing picassos and and so forth which which i you know (laughs) i don't have the financial wherewithal to do anyway but i'm just saying like when i'm absorbing this stuff and like like uh i would say absorbing it into my creative dna you know i think that's what i'm doing whether it's with music or literature or art or whatever, I'm trying to, I'm trying to take elements of what I appreciate in other people's works. And, uh, I'm trying to take those elements and incorporate them into myself. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping that it inspires me to produce something of my own so so if if other people are doing something similar for a different reason that's you know god bless them sure but but let's just can we explore this like idea of like branding a little bit more though in terms of like like for example that i can't remember the painter's name you might remember it's like the dude with the apple in front of his face magritte you know what i'm talking about magritte yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like like an image like an image like that. Like it's so separated from the you know, from the study of of beauty in a way now, right? And it's more like, "Oh, I saw that painting." Like and now it's like something that you would just and then you would go to the gift shop and you'd buy it on a tote bag. That's funny you right? mentioned that. My uh I think my sister-in-law has an obsession with Magritte in particular. And I think she did exactly that. Went to the gift shop and bought like a print and then <laughs> framed it and put it uh, put it in her home. But 
I don't know. Whatever, man. People can like what they like and dislike what they dislike. No doubt. No doubt. But I know what you're saying. Do you want like an, a super famous painting? Would you, like if you had one? Like I'm trying to like decide right now. We moved into a new flat, so I'm trying to like decide like what kind of art we could put up on the walls, you know? And I'm wondering like what is gained or lost by electing to put a super famous painting up. You know, why not paint one of your own? That w- and that's what we're considering doing. But I'm just saying that's what I would. If we were to put, that a- would be the most satisfying. Yeah, agreed. But it's also interesting, like when someone does put like uh, the Starry Night up on a wall. It's yeah. Like, to what extent are you responding to the painting itself, right? And to what extent are you just like so? You're signifying. Yeah, what are you signifying when you do that? And how, how are you defining beauty? Like what? I don't know. It's just weird. But it is beautiful. Like I like those paintings too. You know. So it's like, I'm very conflicted on that on that on this particular topic. But it's just weird, because I guess I'm just saying these these things I would say are consequences of like the mass media world that we're living in and like the hierarchical world that we're living in and the branding world that we live in. Right. Like this is like we've been. I don't know. It's just like convenient for capitalism. I would argue. I don't know, but probably it's convenient for capitalism to like set standards of like, oh, this is the thing you're gonna want to pay ten bucks to go see if this comes to your city, right? You're gonna go and want to go see like this. We've decided that this is like a famous painting. It's interesting that you mention Magritte because uh, I grew up seeing a lot of his work on display at the uh, Manil Gallery in Houston. I think. Dominique uh-huh. de Menil had a particular fondness for Magritte because she okay. she purchased a lot of his paintings and so I always saw those you know like the the one with the big rock and I don't know if the one with the apple is there but um, and I have nothing against this yeah artist, yeah yeah that was but just a random but I yeah, sure you know he was never my favorite but then when I don't even know how to explain this, but when I went to Belgium and mm-hmm. uh, just stayed there for a few days, I felt like I understood him better. Something about the the weather there made me feel like I understood his paintings better, like especially the the uh, the way he uses light and shadow. I can't. I, and that's good. And I, mean, I, I can't. Think... So it's like, you know, the I, I was I felt like I was able to get beyond the brand. Right. You know, right. like even if I see the iconic image, I, I feel like I can experience it differently just from having been sure been to the place where he had his origin. Right. And I mean, I think ultimately I should just be thankful as someone who is a lover of the arts. Like, I should be thankful if someone's have, enjoying fine art in general, you know, like, because a lot of people don't even like art at all. So if you're enjoying aesthetic and a painting, whatever filter has been placed on that for you, fuck it, you know, like, yeah, enjoy, enjoy some beauty, <laughs> whatever you, however you're defining it. You just mentioned another important word, aesthetic. Fuck it. Yeah, that okay. too. What's the etymology of fuck it? No, I'm I'm thinking of aesthetics, but I think we should uh, leave that discussion for another time. Um, one one other. Thing. Sorry, I've been a little bit hyper on this episode. <laughs> no, not at all. I think I'm. Yeah, I've been I had all this pent up shit to. Well, I mean, it's get out it's great. Out. Like you, you really were the culture hound, like running all over the, the city trying to find Kandinsky's. That's great. I I I looked to see if there were any uh, Kandinsky's in Taipei. I had no success with that. There might be something somewhere, but I wasn't able to find it. But I was thinking about how. You know, by the way, that's interesting too, right? Like the cities that host these paintings, that's like a 
huge power play type. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, in a way that like that places flex their their power. Right. And now you've got like the Arab states trying to like buy a lot of art and stuff. Anyway. Well, and and Go just on. you know, you mentioned where was he in Berlin? You know, like at that time that was the place to be. He he leaves Russia. Well, he was in Munich, Munich, but then he ended up in Paris. Oh, okay. Uh yeah. But he leaves Russia, right? Because he feels like Right. He feels like what? He can't his work won't be properly appreciated there. I mean, he left before the revolution. There's a bunch of stuff. If you want, I can give you all the politics stuff, but he's basically been chased out several times. Like he got chased out of Russia after his art was considered too subversive by the Soviets. And then he was chased out of Germany at but wait, the he went, onset this was, of World War One. This was in... World War Two. sorry. But this was 1913, right? Do I have the date right? Composition 6. Right. And he was already in Germany then. That's pre-Soviet Revolution. So he went back... Yes, he went back and initially he was celebrated by like by the Soviets. Okay. Like some I think some friend of Lenin's wife really liked him and he had like a powerful position in terms of defining or choosing how to curate the initial Soviet galleries and so on. And then there was the decision made that all art should only be Soviet realistic and he, his art was suddenly considered subversive and and basically, he left at that point, and he was offered a position at the Bauhaus in Munich. Was that under Stalin, so like, or was it still during the not Lenin yet, era? Not yet. I assume it was still Lenin. Hmm. But either way, the point is, he was chased out at one point of Russia, and he was also chased out of Germany by the yes, Nazis. Yes, right. So that he ends up in France. And all his last war, and he gets French citizenship, and he actually got German citizenship as well. But he was, didn't prevent him from being chased out. So, but France was like the ultimate haven. But uh, even though France was under German occupation, he still managed to keep producing work until his he died in 1944. Hmm. But yeah. Okay. Well, I was just gonna say that you know, at this particular time in history. How do we experience these artworks? You actually had the fortune of going to see the actual painting, but for most of us, that's not mm -hmm. an option, right? So what do we do? We we go online. We look at images online, and if we want background information, we go online. So mm -hmm. I went. I randomly went to YouTube, right? And I just do a search, Kandinsky. Let's see what comes up. Sure. And what pops up? A video of the actress Helen Mirren talking about her love for Kandinsky. He's apparently her uh -huh. favorite artist. She did a a spot for MoMA, right? And the, and MoMA has uh -huh. these four Kandinskys. And she talks quite eloquently and movingly about experiencing these Kandinsky paintings and she she says she likes to get very close she makes like the security people nervous when she's yeah actually I liked that part because it may actually influence the way I looked at paintings the last couple of days I tried to kind of get that arm's length away oh okay so you watch the video I'm talking about yeah even if I didn't I don't really know who she is by the way Helen Mirren <laughs> Sorry, oh, bro. No, my give me some roles that she's played. Maybe I'll. Well, I was, I mean, as a teenager and young man, I was, I was uh, obsessed with her as uh, DCI Jane Tennyson. Uh, what was the name of that series? Uh, well, she plays a police inspector, but uh, she's been. And a lot of things. And she's married to the okay. director, uh, what's his name, Taylor Hackford. I don't know. Yeah, well, she's she's of Russian heritage herself. Okay. Uh, but, you know, her family immigrated to the UK. But anyway, she's, uh, she, loves, she loves her some Kandinsky. 
<laughs> yeah. But did you want to say, like, because you said how the internet was, like, moderating your experience of... Well, it is. It's inevitable, or, you know, so, like... But is that is that where it ends, though? Just the fact that you came across this video? Or I thought you were going to have some other, like... Well, just, it's it's interesting to think about how our experience of these artworks is mediated by the internet basically like what's available there you know right. what else are we going to do we can't at the moment we don't all have before you know just discussing this work we don't all have the option of jetting to st petersburg to roam around especially not yeah, now to roam around the halls of the hermitage right so we go online i mean before yeah. the internet maybe we would purchase a uh kandinsky an art book. Yeah, yeah a book with with reproductions but now yeah. we we go online we can watch videos we can you know in addition to personal reactions like Helen Mirren's we can we can watch videos about the life of Kandinsky or about the theories of Kandinsky you know I mean I wonder how does that affect our you know, our interactions with the work I mean Mark Mark Zuckerberg might be getting a boner right now like thinking about like how through a virtual headset we're going to be able to experience art like really viscerally or like very close to the f actual physical experience you know who knows that might be true that you might be able to appreciate size detail a lot better once we have a little bit more sophisticated technology yeah we can enter kandinsky's overflow in the meta in the metaverse <laughs> yeah i mean i'm not a fan of that shit but at the same time just in terms of scale, it might be considerably easier in the next 10 years, you know, because even today I was thinking like, uh, if I had an HDMI cord, I could, because I, I, we don't have a big TV, but our TV is like a little bit bigger than a laptop screen. So I could have easily at least hooked it up to a TV. And then, but if you had a headset, you know, who's to say that you wouldn't be able to see it really large. And that could be cool. Yeah, but that's At like the same time as it would be cold and Yeah, I mean it it doesn't replace the real experience, right? No. It's like no porn versus real sex. <laughs> yeah, but you have to, and I'll I'll leave that for a second, but but you have to admit that that would be a big step you know, in the in I mean it would help a lot, right? Just to be able to see a painting larger. Yeah. That would make a big difference. So you know, get on it, Mark Zuckerberg. Like, let's oh, get I'm that. sure he is. I want that. I'm sure he is. <laughs> yeah. And pretty soon you'll be able to access all his goodies through a microchip in your wrist or something. Injected in yeah, me, bro. You'll own nothing and be happy. <laughs> We're bumping up yeah. on an hour and a half here. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't manage to? No, I think we covered pretty much everything I had on my list. Okay, well, I'll just leave. I want to say a little bit more about color. Just, I think, uh, I think Kandinsky would be would feel like he had been successful if he makes us reevaluate our relationship to color and and appreciate just the fact that when we look around we can see color like color is free you know like a homeless person can enjoy color and we get that just by being human like if we look at it with a sense of appreciation rather than like you know taking it for granted like we can get a lot of i can look at this banana and oranges and, be, and just and try to push myself a little bit to be like yo that's some pretty sick yellow you know like so maybe we should try to appreciate color more because obviously Kandinsky was in love just with color. Like that was enough for him to feel elated and stimulated. And I think, yeah, so I think that we should think about color more and appreciate it more. Oh, I 
Yes, I agree. I love color. I think I I have a very healthy appreciation for it. Nice. Do you want to say anything more about that? Well, I was thinking about the the colors of the last painting that we we considered the Picasso, the Weeping Woman, uh-huh. and that was always one of the things that attracted me to it the the colors more right. more so than this one to be honest but you know i don't i don't dislike the colors in this that's okay like i prefer the monet colors to the one we've looked at i mean i prefer the monet yeah, painting yeah. that kandinsky refers yeah. to you know it's just i think the impressionists the way that they deal with light it's just it's just more beautiful if in the way that i think of yeah. beauty but yeah but we have a a feast of colors all around us and listeners i hope that our voices today have created a synesthetic effect on your eyes and you've been like seeing bursting rainbows yeah that's an interesting question what (laughs) what color is is my voice and what color is tomek's voice exactly the color of orgasms. Sorry. <laughs> that sounds that All sounds right. like a, a rainbow. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, it seems like ninety minutes is our standard. Uh, is the standard length of our discussion, our discussions these days? I could days. go longer, bro, but I think uh, I could go longer, but I've started to feel a bit indulgent. So. Mm. Yeah, we should end it here. <laughs> Uh, okay. What's next? That's my choice, right? You tell me. Yeah. Have you thought about that? Well, I'm thinking about the recent uh, death of the uh, British monarch. And right. uh, I'm not particularly interested in her, but we should probably discuss a text that relates to the the institution of british monarchy in some way so we'll see as you like bro. maybe something to do with that next week i'm curious because whatever you choose you know like these texts that we choose end up like dictating how i experience my week Mm -hmm. so they become quite quite instrumental so okay well choose choose wisely choose carefully (laughs) okay okay everyone all right thanks everybody for listening yeah don't forget to subscribe at substack ah vasily kandinsky still going strong 2022 peace everybody texting